This is the Math Math Book Club, where ordinary parents encourage one another to develop an extraordinary appreciation of math. We love what we know and struggle over the unfamiliar. Through weekly conversation and exploration among friends, we can begin to enjoy ideas that seem difficult. Join our book club as we discover how math helps us to know God and to make him known. Hello, everybody. Uh, it is just me today, uh, me and our host of wonderful guests. Um, that includes all of you that are bringing your ideas um, along with our curriculum assistants and um, product sales specialists and pilot tutors. Um, so we're really, I'm so grateful that all of you are here. Lee is not joining us today because her newest grandbaby has arrived. So uh, we're certainly praising God that Violet is here. I'm very excited about that. And we are going to wrap up this um, session of the book club with weeks or lessons 29 and 30 uh, today. And then next week, we'll be jumping into our summer sessions. We'll talk about that a little bit more before we end today. Um, but this is our, our final of this 15 week stretch. And so just looking at our math map, um, remembering that every week in community, we're encouraging our tutors to take the time to say, where are you on your map? And then also encouraging families at that time to say, hey, where, where are we? Um, reviewing which uh, domain that we're working in and we're using the naturals lessons, they're red. Um, and then looking at the lessons. And so down at the bottom, you see we're doing lessons 29 and 30. Are there any lingering questions before we jump into lesson 29? I had a question come up in an um, event this week. One of my parents was asking for the different lessons for each of the 30 weeks, do we have a document that kind of outlines in a more traditional math sense the labels for that like triangles and circles being more um, trigonometry or the calculus or things like that uh we don't have a document i think once they see the charts that the charts are going to really give them that greater detail um, i think when we a uh, math map this document here it's a really great brief scope and sequence that helps us to really chart where we are those charts are going to give us our detailed um, scope for each of those lessons and really help to identify what the topics are each week. So that's, I keep pushing people back to seeing those charts when they want more detail. Um, and I know that's hard because a lot of people don't have access to them yet, but as people look at those charts, that's really what they're going to be able to get from those. Does that help? I think what they're looking for is more like, if I have a calculus question, which chart or which lesson do I go to? The, um, I, I understand. I think the glossary may be uh, the thing that's gonna help um, because we do in the glossary have the chart references. So if they're looking for something about a derivative or an integral and they look that up in the glossary, they're going to be able to see which charts are going to be relevant to that information. Uh, okay. So I think that, that that's probably the resource you're looking for. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? All right, well, let's go ahead and look at lesson 29. And you're gonna notice that I have pulled out the charts for lesson 29 and 30 because uh, the, lesson booklets are blank booklets. Um, and so when we think about our seeing the unseen booklet is a blank booklet that students are going to be encouraged to be filling over the course of a year. Uh, we know that for some, it may be over the course of a week or a day, uh, but ultimately the goal is for people to be interacting with this book over the course of a year and including things in there that have helped them to see math and the world around them or help them to see the unseen. And uh, then in lesson 30, we're gonna be talking about blue books. So again, it's a blank book that the students are going to be filling. Uh, so this week we are decided to go ahead and pull these charts up and have some conversations. So instead of talking about what's familiar and unfamiliar, I wanted to open up the conversation and ask you to think for a minute, why are you teaching your children mathematics? And 
then you may need a minute to think about that. Um, and so um, I'm going to, I'll just share sure, sort of my testimony uh, about mathematics. And when I was in high school, I was, at, well, in all of my sort of primary and secondary schools, I was a good student. Um, I was academically gifted and school came somewhat easily for me. I did not necessarily value the gift that God had given me. Um, and even now, I think that our society puts an undue emphasis or value on academic prowess of younger students. But that's who I was. And so I enjoyed reading. I loved to read. I didn't necessarily love mathematics, um, even though I, I did well in it. When I went to backing up um, in high school, most of my teachers were women. And uh, most of the, the women who were my teachers were not teaching because they were necessarily in love with teaching. Uh, most of them were teaching because it was one of the few things that were open to them um, as they were coming of age. They were not encouraged to be engineers or doctors or such. And so those that had interests in mathematics and sciences ended up in teaching. And so all of my math teachers were women um, and all but my um, biology two teachers were us, uh, all of my science teachers, except for biology two were women. Um, and, and so they really encouraged me and the other young women um, in my classes to become scientists and engineers and so on. So, you know, we went to all the women in engineering days and I went to college thinking, well, I'm expected to be an engineer. Um, my first year in college, I took an introduction to engineering design class and I hated every single minute of it. I did not, I felt like it. I felt it was tedious having to draw and be really specific. So I have so much respect for engineers who, who are so disciplined. And I just thought, I can't do this for four years. And so the truth of the matter was, I just looked around and I went, what's the easiest major? At the time, I planned to have a career in the Coast Guard. And I really wasn't that worried about what my major was. And so math and computer sciences was what I perceived was going to be my easiest major. And that's why I chose it. Um, so even, even through my college years, I can't say that I really found joy in mathematics because it was still being taught in this very didactic, very, here's the problems, go solve them. Okay. And I wasn't really introduced to anything exciting or joyful about math. I went, I had, um, I had my time in the Coast Guard. Um, I was discharged because of my migraines and my 30 year career crumbled around me as God revealed that that was not his plan. And I did not know what I wanted to do. Um, so I actually went um, through the VA and got a vocational rehabilitation assistance and spoke with somebody who said to me, well, you know, what about teaching? And again, being completely transparent with all of you, I went, oh, summer's off. That does sound good. Um, and so I I went back to school and I got my master's uh, in secondary math education. And um, that's really where I discovered how much I loved mathematics. I took classes that challenged me, that excited me, that just revealed whole new avenues of mathematics that I had never encountered before. And I went, oh, why don't we share this with people, right? Why do we keep these things hidden? Um, and that's really where I fell in love with math. And when I started to teach my own children, it was that, that joy of just seeing how we can really see the unseen, all of these different patterns and all of these different ways of thinking that come from mathematics. And that's what I wanted to share with my children. Again, full disclosure, my children are not necessarily in love with mathematics, um, even though I think they should be, and I think they're really good at it. I always say it's a profit in their own land, right? Um, 
syndrome that, that they're like, yeah, mom, okay, whatever. Um, although this year my daughter did go, okay, so I'm starting to see some of this joy and math thing, but I'm never going to admit it. So anyway, so that's, that's my story uh, behind mathematics and why I, why I wanted to teach my children mathematics. Um, and your story hopefully is different. So is there anybody who would like to share why you're teaching your children mathematics? I think the big reason that I teach my daughter mathematics is that so she can function in society. Um, I have a love hate with the meme that goes around every year this time of year. Why didn't they teach me taxes in um, school? And like, did they teach you how to read? Did they teach you how to follow instructions? And did they teach you how to add and subtract? Those are the three skills you need to do your taxes, either that or how to go pay a guy. So, <laughs> you know, either one, it's, they involve math either way, but it's just, you have to have math to function. And so the more math she knows and the more she understands, the more things that she can do. Yeah. And I want to thank you for, that was the, that was a, an inspiring testimony. Um, uh, Kirsty and Donna. Um, but I, I would say I have five children and none of them love math. In fact, most of them don't, get math they're just like maybe a concept will click one day and then the next day it's like blank page again and um my friend janet waldrop who works for cc too she she would always tell us she's like the higher maths that's where it really gets exciting and fun and where you get to see the beauty and and we just don't ever get there with our kids and i'm seeing now this math map has me so excited because i see the potential for very young children to start seeing the, the, the exciting things that usually you don't see until you're getting your master's degree in math. Um, I know that I, just from, just from one year of working through this with my 12 year old, so much has opened up to me. And I'm, I, I feel a little sad because I don't have any younger students to come up through, like he'll be in challenge B next year. So he's, been miss you know I've, I've been following the rollout now for years and like oh is it gonna oh is he oh and I almost held him back a year this year so that he could get the challenge math map experience but I'm going to try to give it to him anyway at home um but it's super exciting because I feel like feeling feeling like you understand something is directly related to how much you enjoy it and and it's a cycle and so the more aha moments and the more, oh, that the, like it drives more desire to learn more, which, which gives more enjoyment. And, and I just see this as being, I, I tell everybody I talk to about the math map, this is revolutionary. It is going to change, not just CC, it is eventually, it is going to change the world. <laughs> Thank you, Jana. Thank you, Donna. And uh, anybody else want to share? why they teach math. So Can it I is share? okay. Yeah, please oh, go ahead. I wanted to talk about um, why I don't have a math curriculum, even though I have a challenge B student and a, an older foundation student and a, and a younger foundation student. Um, I hate all math curriculum. And mostly it is because I have worked in engineering and I did all the math and I was, I'll read something in a math curriculum and, and Saxon is, is fine. That's fine. Um, but it always kind of makes me mad because it takes the joy out of it. And so I'll just, I just throw it away and we'll work on multiplication or addition with my young guy. And, um, but I always just say, don't, don't worry about that other stuff. Don't worry about it. Like they look at an exponent and completely lose their minds. I'm like, that's fine. That's fine. We're just going to set, set it aside. We'll work on multiplication some more. And then we'll get, and we'll get to that other stuff. And I feel like, um, because they, everybody focuses on the STEM stuff and they don't understand that those are the artifacts of the math and we can't jump over all of it. I was telling somebody the other day, like, it's we're it's sitting in the valley and we could see the mountain way far away and we want to be on the mountain, but there's no appreciation for the journey. 
And I think the journey is what we're getting with the math map. And I really like that things um, are pulled together in the charts, like division. Uh, I mean, just the fact that they talk about ratios and um, percentages and everything is part of division. And I thank goodness, because this is what I've been telling the kids. They freak out when we when you turn the page and they're like, percentages are something totally different. It's no, no, no. It's all the same. You're getting, I love this, the nods that I'm getting you guys. Are, so I see that everybody's having those moments where like, I hate this. Why do they make it? It's all, it's all the same. It's going to be fine. And I'll hear people say, oh, my kids don't understand fractions. I was like, don't worry about that. No, if you're, you know, your seven-year-old doesn't understand fractions, it's going to be okay. <laughs> Circle back around. We're classical. It's going to be okay. So, but Chris, Kirsty, thank you again. That was a, a beautiful testimony as well. So I'm glad that you are the one guiding us on this journey. <laughs> Well, thank you, Alyssa. And I love that about not needing a curriculum. Um, because obviously we really want you all to go and buy the math map because CC has invested a lot of money into this. So go please buy the math map, buy a curriculum. But um, I had a great conversation with a mom this week who has um, a profoundly gifted student. And she said, so I could just get the charts and work through these, this is gonna give me this guideline for my student because maybe working through the booklets isn't the right, isn't perfectly for them. But man, we could take those charts and we can dive in and we can explore. And it just opened up a whole new realm. And so I love the fact that you said, right, that that idea of not, right, it goes back to the old idea that we talk about, we've talked about before, right, is using the book and not letting the book use you. Um, and so the curriculum is here to help you uh, exercise pages. They're here to help you do this at home, not to become a taskmaster. Um, because we really, we want kids to be excited because if they're excited about it, they're going to go have fun. So whether that's playing games with the flashcards or out of quick flip arithmetic or um, looking at the art and talking about big ideas or going for nature walks, um, right? The, as we build that excitement, um, sometimes, and sometimes I'm going to be honest, right? It feels like those are easier to do with our younger students. And then we start going, well, what about algebra? And we start getting anxious. And um, one of the things I'm hoping that we're going to see through the math map is that we can have conversations about these advanced concepts, these algebraic ideas, even if we're not doing the algebra, and over the number of years, our students are going to develop algebraic reasoning and understanding. So then when we suddenly say, okay, we'll now actually do the computations with letters, it's going to be like, oh, this is just expressing the idea, the, the concepts that I've already been playing with for a number of years, right? Instead of it being this foreign thing that just becomes so frustrating that we, we regress and algorithm. So thank you. And I just want to say to everybody that's listening and maybe feels like we've all been like, really, like, here's my big reason for math. It's okay to say, hey, my child wants to be um, an architect and they need math, right? It's okay to say my kid wants to go to college and they have to have these math credits. It's okay to say that that's why you're teaching math. Um, really practical motivations and that's okay. I'm hoping that over the course of using the math map, people are going to see that, that we can shoot higher than that and still accomplish those goals. Um, and that's what this booklet is really about. When we talk about seeing beyond the scene, we're saying that our, our goal at the math map, right? one of our goals at the math map for creating the curriculum is to help families see the unseen right, to, to picture, to grasp a picture, not just of what's happening in mathematics beyond three dimensions, but how does that exercise of looking for what's beyond help us to know God, right, or help, help to make him known, right? How can I begin to have a, a little bit more of a grasp? What does it mean for God to be infinite and eternal, right? Because in my practical experience, there is nothing infinite and there is nothing eternal, right? But math gives me a way of interacting with those ideas, right? There is nothing in my life practically, right? My concrete life that's limitless, 
right? But math gives me a way of talking about limits. So when, when, when we think about math helping us to know God, right? Those are some of the ways. And there's, there's so many ways, right? We, we've talked about some of them over the course of the year. We could keep on going, just like John says, right? That if we had all the books and all the galaxies, right? We, there wouldn't be enough uh, to contain what, what there is to say about God and, and how we can know him. Um, but that the purpose behind the Lesson 29 booklet is to continually be emphasized that our goal in, in pursuing mathematics is to know God. Um, so we've spent a lot of time, so I'm going to go ahead and look at our next couple of pages here, and um, we're just going to jump through our questions. So the Lesson 29 booklet um, on our it's a little bit about seeing the unseen. And then our next three pages are going to give you some ways that um, we can use our five senses, right? That math interacts with our five senses. This is not, we are not practicing the math concepts here. Um, we are not, is not intended to be more grammar. This is intended to say, hey, here are some ways that you can inter math through your five senses so now now go take what you heard and go look outside right and what do you see where do you see math all around you um, so i think one of the easiest ways is through sight but what do you guys think how do we how do we discover math by using our sight and you can think of like here's a specific example i saw this and that gave me an idea um, right, an understanding of math, something I saw. So years ago, Kirsty, I told my mom about Fibonacci numbers in nature, and we happened to be at the beach, and she spent an entire day um, picking up shells and counting their ridges to see if she could find one that wasn't in the Fibonacci sequence. It was pretty funny. <laughs> That's beautiful. That's a great story. I was just going to say that because I, I actually sat in on a, um, a math, uh, STEM day and they talked about the Fibonacci series, um, and a pineapple. Um, so if you just look at, at a pineapple, um, you should be able to count the number of rows in the diagonal and it follows the Fibonacci series. So I thought that was really neat to see something in nature. Yeah. Those numbers like just when you see those things like that, you just go, well, how can there not be a God, right? How could it just spontaneously happen to me anyway? It's like the, um, right, it couldn't just happen book that we used to use where you go, yeah, how, how could that just happen? It can't. You've probably seen the little video that goes through, like even the shape of the galaxies is Fibonacci sequence or down to like fingerprints on, on our finger. Like, and I think that's the, the fingerprint of God is the title of the video that the CC showed at a practicum a few years ago. And that is just, that has blown my mind time and time again, the shape of your ear and yeah, super cool. I was thinking about it with the uh, with the eclipse last week. We had to go see the totality and thinking about the ratios and proportions of the sun and the moon to the part of the earth that we were on and also the, the polar coordinate systems that we've been looking at and how the uh, the line of the, the shadow of the moon moving across the surface of the earth reflects this amazing four-dimensional model that it's hard for our brains to imagine, but that we actually can figure that out. It's pretty amazing. That's a great example. Um, I love that of, of our sight because, right, how, we, what we see, right, was all about ratio and proportion. That's a great example. I mean, there's lots of ways, right? When we think of sight and we think of reflections, looking in mirrors, right? The When you look outside and you see symmetry. So any of those kinds of things, when we talk about our art, we're using our sight. So there's so many different ways that we can think about um, engaging in math with our sight. Certainly just when we're working through our exercises, right? It would be a lot harder to do that if we don't have um, good eyesight. Um, that 
you know, that's something that a lot of us probably take for granted is, is just being able to look at a, a page of exercises, even if it feels overwhelming, but being able to recognize all of that notation. Um, I did speak with somebody this week who is visually impaired and I thought, well, math has to be so different for you um, because you, you need to interact with it differently, right? That so many things that we take for granted when we can see something on a page um, may not be available. So that makes us appreciate that. How about through hearing? How could you discover math through hearing? Music is math in motion. There's the rhythms and I mean, there's so much. The whole curriculum in challenge three. Perfect, Donna, right? So just music. So whether it's the rhythm, right? That takes me back to um, my foundation's tutoring days, right? Ta, ta, ti, ti, ta. And um, the drums, <clears throat> right? The orchestra song, you go. Right, we can. I'm going to do a favor for all of you. I'm going to implant the orchestra song in your brains, <laughs> and now you will all be thinking about this for the rest of the day. Right, <laughs> the drums oh, playing no. two tones, they're always the same tones. Right, we can all sing together. <laughs> I, I know, I'm, I know, you appreciate that. That was my gift to I, all of you. <laughs> did like you. <laughs> I was, I was thinking, Kirsty, just listening to my children practice the piano when they were young and and uh, not so much the positive, but the negative, like when they were off key mm -hmm. or when it you, they would hit the bad note, you know, the wrong note. Not mm -hmm. the bad. And, and that our brains are so like, how do we know that? you know, I'm not a musical person, but I would know that's not the right note. So our brains are just so in tune with that, that, that sequence and that, that, um, I don't know what the word is, like the between, like what we we anticipate or we mm -hmm. know it's a pattern and when it breaks the pattern and that's the same thing it is in poetry. Like when a poet breaks the pattern, it, it alerts us like, whoa, wait a minute, what happened there? So I think sometimes math helps us establish pattern but also helps us recognize when it breaks the pattern so i think that's interesting i love what you just said because we were talking about music but then you brought in poetry and the idea that poetry we can read it but when when it's spoken aloud right poetry has so much more power right that hearing because we hear the meter and that is a mathematical idea right so Right when we think about the integratedness of our strands, right? So especially for those of us who um, may be in that season, so we think about the integratedness of the strands, right? We may not think of math and poetry, but you know, I just love the fact that you just recognized how important math is to to that. So it's really beautiful, Kirsty, that our children, little children who don't know that there's supposed to be a difference between music and math and poetry um, can make that really clear for us. We have had the blessing of have, of being around our almost two-year-old grandson a lot lately when his, since his little sister has been born. And um, one of the, he loves music. And so we can pick out, my husband and I started picking out on the keyboard, the octave. And so when you get to the eighth note, I have started playing a wrong note. Like if I'm in the upper registry, I'll, I'll play a low note and he will jerk his head up and he doesn't know if he's not watching, he doesn't know what I'm supposed to be hitting, but he does know that that wasn't it. And my husband has also started, he likes to watch drumming videos, my, my grandson, not my husband. <laughs> and so my husband has been trying to teach him to count the meter and so we've done the one, two, one, and two, and three, and, and we've done one, two, three, one, two, three. And I passed him in the house the other day and he had his little drumsticks and he was going one, two, three, one, two, three. He's 22 months old, but he is making connections between counting and rhythm and sounds on the keyboard and on the guitar. 
And I can see that he is going to be fun to do math with because I haven't messed him up yet. <laughs> well, another layer of this that I've really enjoyed is I have a background in audio engineering and just with running a sound, whether it's in church or in other contexts and all the frequencies and vibration of air and just, you know, what, what sound does to the environment that it's in. It's just, it's all so mathematical and so beautiful. And, um, you know, without getting into a ton of the technical terms, just like the, the things that you can start to see happening and frequencies and the, the patterns in the heart, like you're talking about, I'm probably more like talking about the, the mathematical parts of it where you see in thirds and in eighths just how the frequencies interact together it's it's amazing it really is um i mean and, and we could keep going right because when we think about music and just the shapes right the reflections and the shapes of our spaces what makes it a good space what makes it a bad space for music um so definitely a lot of fun conversations but i'm going to go ahead and this one is maybe a little bit more fun um, but also a little bit more challenging because how could you discover math through smell, taste, or touch? And I will say Julie um, and Jana, I was thinking of both of you that while I can look at my shell or my pineapple, I could also, right, I could feel those ridges um, and the counts. Right. So that that felt to me or the pineapple, right, that those were very tactile objects where I could play with touch. How else could I think about math in smelling, tasting and touching? I had a funny thought. You can certainly smell when you cook something too long and then too much time has gone by. Well, that's a great. I don't know Do we... much about candy making, but along that, that thought, Kelly, um, I know that if you boil sugar, like to like different temperatures, it becomes, you know, like, softball, hard crack, whatever. My sister makes peanut brittle all the time. So I've kind of watched that, you know, go wrong and, and go right most times. Tasted it, go right. So That's great. So time and temperature, what a different, like when we think about smell, um, right? Can we, can we keep a track of how much smell there is? Right, do we? We maybe don't have a number for it, but do we know if there's a lot of smell or not as much smell? Yeah. Some people, some people are more sensitive than others, right? But you, probably most of us have been somewhere where you go, oh, somebody's got a lot of perfume on, right? Or a strong perfume on, or, oh, somebody changed a baby's diaper here, right? And so we, we do quantify smell, even if we don't necessarily have a scale for it, right? Um, do we quantify how things taste? Can things be more sweet and less sweet? Right? So anytime we start to quantify things, we're thinking mathematically. And in the case of my son, he did um, <clears throat> concentrations of dye and sports drinks for his Challenge A Science Fair. And so he decided one day when we were diluting all these sports drinks as part of the experiment that he would taste them all. Let me tell you what, diluted, highly diluted Gatorade does not taste very good. <laughs> Uh, we felt the earthquake from that happened in Pennsylvania up here last week, and that was a very physical relationship to some numbers that were put on what an earthquake is measured in. That's a I hadn't really thought about that, but just the weather, right? So hurricanes, tornadoes, just a windstorm, rain, um, earthquakes. Right. All those things that are, I mean, weather, there's so much math that goes into our weather and we can certainly feel that, you know, that sense of touch. Those are all great. All right. So just going back, um, just to wrap up lesson 29, again, those charts are there to more be fun than to give more grammar, but to just help people go, okay, well, what are some different ways that I might interact with math around us? 
and give us some more ideas of what might end up in that lesson 29 booklet. I also wanna mention that back, way back in booklet number one, the Ex Nihilo booklet, the bottom um, of every single page has examples of the kinds of things you might put into a Seeing the Unseen booklet. Um, and, and I will emphasize this because it has been the subject of many conversations. This is intended to be a student project, not a parent project, that this is not a, hey, look at what I did, but this is really supposed to be an exploration of each student and what, what captured their imagination, what did they see? And it may be, hey, I was really proud of myself when I was able to solve this problem. Here's, here's an exercise I completed and I solved it and I felt proud of myself, that goes in my book. Um, so it does not have to be super lofty. Um, it can it can be a question of what they've done over the course of the year, but it is intended to be a student project, not a parent project, right? And with, with no expectation of it being perfectly done. So. I have a question about lesson 29. What is this sure. supposed to look like at home and in the challenge community? So um, interesting that you asked that because um, our mentor tutors this week, we were talking about this and, and they have some different ways. So one of the goals is that uh, tutors will be encouraging students throughout the year to be looking for things that they might include there in their lesson 29 booklet. And students can start putting stuff in that booklet week one, right? You got it, go ahead, start putting things in it as you find it. Practically speaking, we know most may not do that. Um, but we have markers set, um, right, to remind the tutors to say, hey, you know, here's what my booklet looks like. This is what you should be doing at home. Now, there's two approaches. One is that in, le in week 29, because remember, we have changed things so that we introduce in class and students complete at home. So for lesson 29, in class, uh, you may review what you're going to be expecting on your blue book and then talking about uh, your lesson 29. What are you going to put in there? You can work through these charts and discuss that. Send the students home to complete that lesson 29 booklet um, along with their blue book prep. And then in lesson uh, in week 30, um, after you've done the blue book or before the book, you could have your students share their lesson 29 booklets. Other tutors um, have found that they like where they've been reminding students all year to get this booklet done and they have them actually bring their booklets completed on lesson 29 and then they use that as a time to present to one another. So either really either one of those um, ways can work. It becomes an opportunity to celebrate uh, the year and then also kind of review for your blue book, whether you're doing that um, right pre to bring it to lesson 29 or um, at home after lesson 29. Um, and I think some of our mentor tutors have also brought some things in on week 29 and said, okay, so look, here's some magazines. Let's, you know, if you need help getting started with this, let's go and look for some things that you could um, to give them a start. So there's some different ways to use, to use this in class. Does that help? does. Thank you very much. Yes. All right. Just a reminder, um, we are getting close to um, our early adopter sale that will be next Tuesday. So before I see you again, you can go and crash the CC website. Um, but you can go and get those orders in. Um, we have the we, I think some are the, they're, they're there. The first delivery came and is waiting in the warehouse to be shipped out. Uh, so we're very excited to share that with you. Um, and then uh, those other resources are now rolling out on CC Connected uh, for you to start um, exploring. All right, um, looking at lesson 30, um, I wanted to point out that our week 15 blue book was called Assessment and our week 30 booklet is called Reflection. And I just thought I would ask you, what do you think is the difference between the two? And there's no right answer, 
because what we think is the difference between the two may be different in your homeschool. Um, but before I share why we named them differently, what do you think when you hear those words? I, my initial reaction is assessment is stress and reflection is fun. <laughs> but then when you, I mean, they really are, they really can be the same thing if you're doing assessment right. And I think that's just, you know, reflection is a type of assessment, whereas assessment's a broader umbrella. Okay. A lot of times I, I, it seems, well, I think the natural way to look at it is that assessment is an external thing. It's something that happens to me and reflection is an internal thing. It's about what I have seen. Um, and I, I wish that I, I wish looking back, I wish that more of my assessments had encompassed reflection. Yes, yeah, so those are great. And I want to point out that even though, um, right, that there's, there's this, again, this integration of these two ideas, that although lesson 30, week 30, we called assessment reflection, that to get, we can put those two together, right? So as you're designing your blue book for week 15, you may pull some ideas out of the reflection charts, or in week 30, you may pull some ideas out of the um, assessment charts. We, when we came up with this idea of giving them two different names, we were thinking of sort of that assessment sometimes has more of a course correction idea to it. So mid-year, I might want to go, okay, let me see where we are and what might need to change for the second semester. Whereas my reflection feels a little bit more capstone-ish, right? What have I done this year? Um, but that's just how we're thinking of it. And I certainly want to encourage you that you can put all of these charts together to draw from as you think about how you're assessing your student. So we're going to talk through the ideas that we've got in this chart. Um, and on this first page of the chart, understand how you could assess your student's understanding. And I don't know if understanding is the right word. Um, I wrestled with that and I decided to go with understanding. But but how did they see truth, goodness, and beauty, right? What, what does that mean to them, right? And what's the, how can you assess that? Or what are some ways that you assess that? When we think of being classicalists, a big part of what we think about with classical education is the idea of truth, goodness, and beauty. And so are we taking time to assess that? I think the classical way is to do it through um, one classical way is to do it through storytelling, you know, either have them tell a story or within the story, find the truth, goodness, and beauty. So, you know, you could take, you know, the traditional, the, what we think of is we think of like our old world echoes or something like that with the Aesop's fables. It's very obvious in those, but then we graduate to like challenge J where we're in through the challenges where we have, but even in math, you can take that and go to pull out a chart, pull out a chart for one of them and say, okay, where's truth in this? Can you find it? Is there, is there truth in this? Where's the goodness? Where, what is good? Why do I need to learn this? What's the goodness in this? And what do you see that's beautiful? Or do you find beauty in this math? Or is it just frustration at this point? Because there is a point at which it's just frustration and then you know they're just still being dialectic with it. But, you know, it's like, where are you? What do you see? How do you see that? That's great. I love that idea of, of pulling in the idea of story. Because we don't often think of story with, with math, right? We call them story problems as a fancy word for word problems, right? But how can we pull some of those ideas into math? I think reading I, the travel log, you know, that's more of a story, you know, and, there, and mm -hmm. a lot of things that I've noticed in there is that you're pulling in stories from scripture, you know, in the travel log and, and they're related to this math concept of the week. And so, you know, that's a story that we could pull in 
you know, to kind of work with too. Oh, that's great, Babs. Thank you. I do want to point out that way back in lesson one, in uh, chart chart one one, the very first thing that we put in our charts was, "Hey, this is about truth, beauty, and goodness." And so I want to point out that we are starting there and we're ending there. That we are really trying to help parents and students see what is it that we're about, right? And certainly our lesson 29, um, seeing the unseen, right? That's a perfect place to help assess, right? Where did they see truth, goodness, and beauty? Um, beauty, especially as we think visually, but what does beauty look like um, perhaps through our other senses, right? So we can explore some of those things there. Um, and then we have questions here. So I was also gonna point out that we have questions here on chart uh, 31. There are uh, 30 questions about truth, 30 about goodness, 30 about beauty. They may be related to the topic of the week. Not all of them are. Um, uh, some of them are just some questions that were pulled together early on. Um, and then what we've done in the companion is have we have a, it looks like a compass and it talks about uh, truth, beauty, and goodness, knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. And so we put um, questions, these questions, we've gone ahead and put questions on there that relate to um, our grammar, our under, you know, our dialectic and our rhetoric or our wisdom, um, our, and I just lost it. There we go. Um, but our different stages of student, right, are, are that knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. There we go. Um, if I went in the right order, then it clicks. Um, so there are more questions in this to be used at home to spark those conversations. Um, but we've pulled these together here. These are sort of the wisdom questions just to help give some ideas, right? Not that we would expect any student to be able to answer all 90 questions perfectly the way that we might think, um, but to give us some ideas of what, what do these ideas look like and what are some conversations that we can have. All right, on um, our second chart um, for this week, um, our title is Toward Mastery here. And what we've tried to do is we've tried to pick um, one concept and trace that through all of the different domains, through all the different levels. We've done that for just a few things, right? So here's just a few things where we may start. So for example, um, all right, if we, oh, I did not mean to do that. And sorry if I make with all the changes. Um, but if you look under organization here, I know it's hard to see this third chart, uh, column, but we give them um, a challenging um, equation and we ask them to find the domain and the range. And then we're asking them to write a proof. Now, as we step back, right, all the way back, we go back to um, trace four plus five equals nine and then substitution. So we start way back this idea of proof we go back to saying, hey, I can say that four plus five is nine, which means I can use those and it's substitution, but they're just tracing it. So they don't really know what that means, right? But we're starting this idea and we're slowly working through um, over the course of 13 years to assess. And so I just want to encourage each of us, not necessarily to pick what we thought was important, um, but to think through what is it that matters to you? What are some things that you really want your student to master by the time they leave your homeschool, right? When it comes to math. And for some of us, that may be really hard to pick out some things because we haven't really been equipped to be precise and pick out certain things. Hopefully now with the math map, we're going to be equipping parents to go, oh, that's something that matters to me. By the time, well, I would really like my student to know what, what the graph of a parabola is. And somebody might say, I don't care about parabolas, but man, I really want them to know how to uh, tell time. 
and use a calendar, right? So you may pick, these are the things that really matter to me. By the time they leave my homeschool, I want them to, to master this, right? Master everything. And then look at this page here as an example of how can I assess that year over year? What, what can I be looking at year over year to see how I've grown towards that? Um, I do this with my, I've, I've started doing this with my kids, right? Focusing in on, on things. So for example, when we, the last time we went to Disney, um, we went as a dance thing and I took the kids and I said, okay, you each get to pick three things and those three things we'll do, right? Anything else is a bonus. And so we're not going to do everything. Throw it to those uh, three things. And so um, that's what I want to encourage you, right? Is narrow it and say, what is it that really matters to me over the course of my child's education by the time they leave my homeschool? Because I think that we're hopefully giving you the tools now to be able to, to pick out some of those things and work towards it. And that gives you a little bit of freedom for the things that you go, okay, we never really got that, but you go, it's okay, right? Anything else we get is bonus, but um, those things that maybe, right? Maybe I never really understood a hyperbola. Maybe that just never clicked. And you know what? That's okay because it wasn't one of the things that I said was my my top things I wanted my kids to get. So that's what that page is about. Um, So I'm just going to take a minute and let you look at this chart. And I want you to think about how could you approach this chart, right, with skills from the arts of the grammar, the dialectic, and the rhetoric. So if you have grammar age kids, I want you to share what's something you could do with this with those habits. If you have, so those and I know we're in stages, not ages. And so I know I'm doing that wrong. But if you've got those kids that are really emphasizing those dialectic skills, right? Our, our mid-year kids, right? And you're really trying to practice those dialectic skills. How would you practice those dialectic skills, this chart? And then those of you who have older students, how could you bring in some of the rhetorical arts um, to discuss this chart? So I'm gonna give you a minute to think about that. So one thing for the grammar, I'm thinking we did some of this in community in the pilot is coming up with like hand gestures for the different um, graphs here. And so, you know, it, it kind of can become like a little silly game where you can just shout out, you know, one of the, the names and they have to use their arms to do a certain one um, to kind of help with that grammar. Wow, that's yeah. excellent. So you named things, right? There's one of our habits you um, expressed things, right? Using our arms, you were working on memorizing, right? Um, so you had to attend to detail, right? And probably they all went home and told a story, <laughs> right? So there you go. You've got all five of your habits in, in one exercise, right? Anybody else wanna share how they may, may use naming, attending, storytelling, memorizing, expressing with this chart yeah I was thinking to get some tape on the floor and then just have a few of these not all of them, and just have kids like trace it or run like hey do a 
x equals you know a constant and and just get all little ones just running around doing crazy shapes or have them do a shape and we try to figure it out on the chart or yeah just getting them really comfortable with it being a fun thing like here's an x and we try to sort out the um how these numbers reflect themselves through lines and shapes so i think that would be a whole lot of fun to do with wiggly people <laughs> that's great so yeah so bringing in that movement and i love what you said because you said not all of it right and so we don't have to do all of this with our youngest students it may be just some of it right uh, just when you said that i was thinking if you had if you use tape and you actually taped the shapes of the graphs, you could draw, you know, run cars along it. You could walk dolls along it, right? There's so many things we can do to physically get them active, right? Just memorizing. If you, all you did was memorize the names, right? Constant, line, quadratic, rational, right? Just make it a, just a memorization. Because um, remember, we're not trying to understand it. We don't have to connect it. It can be just a memory exercise um, when we're thinking about the grammar um, stage or those grammar skills. So if we were looking at dialectic skills, what are some things that I might do? Comparison. Wonder if... Go ahead, Donna. Oh, I was just thinking, I mean, I wonder if doing a pirate's map, you know, and saying, you know, you do a constant for this long and then you know do you know just giving them some different motions that may be more grammar but still it just popped in my head but doing some kind of a pirate's map with it would be a lot of fun and maybe it's just wrestling with is that possible well that's fun and that's right and that's where we come back to that idea of naming right we're using specific names so instead of just drawing a squiggle on a map actually naming what what does that squiggle represent? So I like that. And Jana, yes, absolutely. I can compare, right? There's so many things I can compare on here, whether it's comparing cosine and sine, what's the same and what's different. Um, what's the same and different between my integral and my derivative and my parent function. Um, what's the same um, moving across, right? What's the same and what's different. So, lots and lots of comparison, right? I could define things. I could ask them, well, what does it, what is the definition of a parent function of an integral of a power function? So at challenging them to define some things, um, right? Any of those, right, circumstances, um, we could draw in um, our circumstances. We could draw in um, some of our relationship questions, right? Because we could talk about just the idea that there are relations and there are functions. And so um, looking at that right-hand column, right, we might start talking about which one of these um, must have been a function um, because it has an inverse, right? So now we're maybe defining, talking about relationship. Um, and then when we think about authority and testimony, right, we might say, okay, well, is, does this constitute authority? What for, right? Where am I this? And then our rhetorical skills, what might we want our rhetorical students to be able to do when they look at something like this? Being able to actually explain what they mean. What, what is a constant? What is a parabola? What, why is this one curved and this one straight? And, you know, basically being able to tell us all the things that we just learned. I like that. So I like to, for me, and I could be wrong. So, right. Don't, don't hold me to this because this is how I understand it. Right. When we think of the dialectic and those light bulb moments, I always think of that as like a personal understanding. Like, Oh, Oh, I get it. I get it. I see it. That's exciting. But then somebody says, okay, well, what did you get? And I go, well, I, I don't know. I just, I know I get it. Right. That rhetorical stage is now where I can turn around and do exactly what Donna said, where they can go, okay, now I'm going to tell you and I'm going to persuade you that I know what I'm talking about, right? Um, and I'm going to, whether that's being able to draw things, right? So expressing 
you know, I think of like our exposition or our um, elocution, um, our style, right, is maybe going to be shown a little bit in how I draw and communicate things visually. Um, my delivery? Am I writing this clearly? Am I showing my steps? Am I convincing you that I know what I'm doing? And am I sharing that joy of mathematics with you convincingly? So, so yeah, so we see a chart like this and it feels really overwhelming. And I'm guessing a lot of you are, oh, that's really overwhelming. Remember, this is not here the first time you see this, that this represents um, a culmination of information that um, students would have seen in weeks um, 9, 11, 13, 17, 18, 25, and 26 at a minimum. So this is now the eighth time that they're seeing these, these images and this information, that they've seen this frequently. Um, and this is just a sum. I just wanted to point out that we can look at something like this that feels overwhelming and that we can, um, break it down for all different students um, on that journey towards mastery. All right, quickly, um, because I realize it's two o'clock and I've talked more than I should have today. Um, our last thing that we encourage you to do is to take math out into your everyday life. And so our last um, page here is um, experiential learning and just some ways that you may experience math, right? In as you go out, out into your summer break. Um, notice, I just want to emphasize this because I think we all need to remember this, that the math map is 30 weeks. The challenge program is 30 weeks. This is not designed to extend into your summer until the next year of challenge starts. You certainly can go back and pull booklets out and say, we're going to review these ideas or finish booklets we haven't done before that is using the curriculum to tailor to your homeschool and meet your students' needs versus feeling like, oh, we've just got to keep going. Everything else is done, but there's no rest because there's still 40 lessons left in the book. Um, but we also want to encourage you, right? A lot of us at the beginning said we want our kids to love math. And so these activities are some ways to take math into your everyday life, to take math um, into the summer, into your breaks and enjoy uh, math together. Um, so I am going to stop there. I do want to remind you that this was the end of this cycle again. Next week, we will be uh, meeting um, at one o'clock still throughout the summer. We will continue. We are going to look at things dimensionally. So next week, we'll be talking about zero D. Um, instead of looking specifically at lessons, we're going to look at some broader ideas about zero D, but really um, we want it to be less us and more you. We want you to uh, feel encouraged to go, whether it's the naturals or the fractions or the complex lessons, whatever it is that you have at home, go look at those zero D lessons and find some things you'd like to talk about and bring those to the book club next week because um, we really want to hear what's captured your imagination or what's challenging you and uh, and have you guys guide our conversation a little bit over the summer. All right. Well, we are um, at the end of time, so I will stay here if there's last minute questions. Um, but otherwise, I pray that you all have a great week and I look forward to seeing you next week. And don't forget, next Tuesday, you can order your very own copy of the Math Map Complex. Thank you, this was great.